Hello, welcome to this Skill Me Up expert talk on securely managing and connecting to resources with Azure Arc and Azure Bastion. My name is Dwayne Natwick. I'm a cloud training architect lead at Opsgility. I'm also a Microsoft MVP and a Microsoft certified trainer. Uh, I have years of industry experience. I have multiple role-based uh, exams, including those around Azure and Microsoft 365 security. Uh, I am active on social media and my links to follow me and to catch up with anything that I'm uh, working on can be found on the slide. And I'm Shannon Keen. I'm a senior cloud advocate at Microsoft. A lot of my job deals with working in the community, trying to help demystify this concept of digital transformation, cloud adoption, and to try to lessen the overall anxiety surrounding what it means to change your skills from a traditional on-premises IT background into more of a cloud infrastructure or cloud native background. I'm very active on uh, Twitter and LinkedIn. You can also catch me on email if you've got any questions or you want to connect and collaborate or just maybe vet some ideas here and there. I always appreciate that. So let's go over the agenda. Today we'll talk about a hybrid strategy. I think if you think through all of the different scenarios right now, not a lot of customers are 100% in Azure or in any cloud vendor at this point. There is this whole notion of hybrid. Hybrid will be here for a while. We'll talk through the strategies involving the hybrid strategy and thinking about ways in which to position your company. Then we'll go through connecting to VMs, right? That's always a, a weird conversation, especially if you don't have any sort of hybrid networking setup. There's ways in which to reduce the attack surface. There are two different uh, services we'll talk about at the end here. One is Azure Bastion. That will be the service that helps you connect to your VM securely without needing any sort of site-to-site -site connectivity. And then there's Azure Arc, a way to have your VMs presented in Azure, just like an IaaS VM. You can apply policy, you can do editing, you can manage, monitor, et cetera. There's a lot of interesting things you can think through as you build out what, lo what it looks like related to a hybrid footprint and leaning on the Azure solutions. So we'll talk a little bit here first about the hybrid strategy. So I think a lot of customers are at various points in embracing a cloud vendor. So if you are in Azure, you know that you've got this idea of Azure policy. You can tag VMs, you can apply Azure policy in a, like a, an initiative definition standpoint or just policy by policy. You don't have that flexibility when it comes to a VM living on premises, right? It's a little harder to think through what that looks like. Um, things have changed in recent times, but I'm trying to think through the whole trajectory of cloud transformation, right? So about, let's say three or four years ago, if you were trying to strategize what made the most sense related to what everything looked like, uh, it was a little harder to see your VMs inside of Azure. You may want to have that single pane of glass, right? A lot of times, cloud providers give you the flexibility of seeing your VMs and the entire state of VMs in a single pane of glass, right? Um, prior to a lot of the newer enhancements inside of Azure, you didn't necessarily have that. And so we, we kind of set across and, and tried to put into play something that would enable a like for like, because we know that there's going to be a scenario where you can't always bring everything into Azure, right? Um, and it's going to be hard if you have to go to multiple places to look at what's happening in your environment. Um, you want to have that unified experience, right? It's really hard if you have to go to five different spots to understand how your workloads are performing, what the overall health is like in the environment, things of that sort, right? So it becomes really, really tough. When you think about the challenges with hybrid, you've got complexity, right? So, you know, I want to have health visibility in a single pane of glass to all my existing and future infrastructure and applications, right? You want to also think about compliance with all of the newer features of, of Azure and the ways in which that we, you know, we've even talked about this, right? The idea of the compliance auditing. You want a way to have all of that show up in one spot. You want to be able to consistently manage security across all your infrastructure assets, right? It, it's really hard if you've got to go to, again, five or six different places to get a feel for how everything's performing. 
Um, you've got this whole idea here too of there, there's some inconsistency potentially, right? You want your on-prem skills to kind of work in the cloud. You want your cloud skills to work on-prem. It's hard that skilling conversation is always an interesting one to have with with customers. Um, you know, if you think about regulation, you know the the DB layer has to remain on on-prem for whatever reason, and you know there's sensitive data that lives there. Maybe there's a security audit uh, that you know it's designated to always live on-prem. It can't ever show up in the cloud until something changes from a regulatory perspective. Um, you know, you want to be able to, to think about what's the right way to build this out so I can still understand what's happening on-prem and also understand what's happening maybe in the web tier inside of Azure. Um, latency is a big factor as well, so you know it's hard to think through what it would be like if you have mission critical applications that are used to low latency and if you try to stretch that into Azure maybe you run into some pain points right things are getting better there's ways to to solve for that but not every single application's made the same unfortunately so that's when you have to think about a hybrid strategy and then if you think through some of the legacy components here too a lot of times there are proprietary apps that were spun up with a developer that has since left the company, right? And nobody has taken the time to unravel what that application looks like. Um, you know, you're able to patch it, you're able to keep it on a VM, but taking it and probably breaking it apart, moving it to more of a cloud native sort of, I guess, feature set, it's a little tougher and it's harder to think through what Evergreen would look like. So it makes more sense right now to maybe leave that on-prem. So if you think through reasons for a hybrid strategy, so it's you know regulatory and data sovereignty. So you want to make sure that you're within the standards that apply to your company. If you have data sovereignty requirements, you want to make sure that everything lives where it's supposed to live, so that you're not flagged in a future audit. You have to think about low latency and edge workloads. That's a really critical feature here or key component of when you actually choose to move into the cloud. And then there's you know the whole idea of the application and data center modernization that conversation is usually a longer term conversation the faster quicker win is the lift and shift kind of version 1.0 of what that strategy looks like over time you want to optimize you want to modernize it's going to take a little bit of back and forth talking with business units talking with developers talking with your ops teams making sure that everybody's on the right page to be able to support it it's not a fast uh, reality. So you're going to have to have a hybrid strategy while you pick apart these workloads and figure out what could potentially be moved into a more cloud native platform. And then if you think about business continuity and resilience, having a hybrid strategy where your cloud becomes your DR site, your backup site, those are easy, quick wins, and that helps you alleviate some of the infrastructure that you'll have on prem related to backup and disaster recovery. Now, customer environments are evolving, right? There's hundreds to thousands of different apps, and a lot of times bigger companies don't really know exactly what they have because they haven't really thought through an assessment cycle, right? But there's containers, databases, there's serverless components, right? Um, that could already live in Azure. You just may not know. And there's a number of different languages that your developers are, are hitting the ground and kind of running with, especially as SDKs evolve and mature over time. There's diverse infrastructure, so there's data centers, there's branch offices, there's a colo provider, there's OEM hardware, there's edge hardware, IoT devices. It's a, it's very much so a mixture inside of every environment, right? I think that's one thing we can all agree on. There's no one environment that's exactly the same. There's trends, there's patterns, there's best practices, but what, you know, if I was hosting infrastructure on-prem, it might look very different than what Dwayne would host if Dwayne was hosting an environment on-prem. Then we also have to think through the idea that a lot of customers are choosing multi-cloud. They have some of their environment in AWS, they have some of their environment in Google, and they have some of their environment in Azure. It's just hard when you think about these sprawling environments. How do you maintain and understand what's been deployed? How do you control your assets? How do you connect to them securely? And that gets to connecting to VMs and how we manage our, our virtual machines, uh, you know, uh, and to kind of go off of, you know, obviously there is a lot of innovation that's taking place within uh, within environments, but still in many uh, environments, both within Azure as well as within uh, within hybrid environments on prem, uh, people still have virtual machines or actual physical, you know, physical servers. So, you know, traditionally you know how do we connect to our virtual machines and what do we do to connect to our virtual machines you know 
uh, connect versus uh, to virtual machines for through a public IP. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, important thing about that is if you're doing that, you're exposing your workloads to uh, you know to the public, and uh, you are susceptible to port scans at that point. Uh, a lot of uh, managed service providers and uh, and customers might set up a, a jump box, which is more of a intermediate point that uh, that you still utilize uh, utilize remote desktop type capabilities to get to that. But then there's another authentication and authorization point to get into the network that houses the pub the public and production workloads. You know the security is managed on that jump box. You know you can create some level of session recording and auditing uh, but uh, but it is still uh, still somewhat exposed to the uh, to the public internet so how do we uh, how do we manage our virtual machines then on uh, in Azure we have you know again still utilizing uh, those uh, those protocols of RDP for Windows or SSH for uh, for Linux based devices and we need to now manage and secure those devices through some level to be able to protect at each of these virtual network layers, whether it's our web, our business tier or our data tier to get to those device, get to those uh, those resources and to manage those resources. So what do we need to do to prevent those breaches and we can prevent those with utilizing tools like port scanning features, brute force, you know, looking for those vulnerabilities within our Azure environment, uh, uh, creating alerts within Azure Security Center uh, when we see those types of attacks take, taking place through the Azure Defender capabilities. Um, also doing vulnerability scans on our on our virtual machines and Azure Security Center, as we mentioned uh, in uh, one of our other talks, has the capability to uh, to do those scans both on uh, on Azure based virtual machines as well as uh, as well as virtual machines that are on other uh, other uh, on premises networks as well as uh, other clouds such as AWS or Google. If they're running a uh, a Windows or Linux based operating system, we can put that uh, put those monitoring capabilities on there and we can then alert on any Kind of port scans or any kind of attempts to attack through those uh, the 3389 or uh, or or uh, port 22 uh, to alert us to potential breaches. But what's a better way to do that? You know, without having to uh, to expose some layer of public IP address. You know, if we're exposing a public IP address, obviously, you know, we could do just in time through uh, Azure Defender. We could uh, limit the IP address ranges of those ports through network secure uh, network security groups, uh, but Azure Bastion provides us with a little bit better way. Uh, the difference here between Azure Bastion and maybe doing a jump box or using RDP or SSH is is we're actually using the browser as that remote connection. We're not. Uh, we're not building a virtual machine or utilizing an actual operating system to get into and jump into those virtual machines. We are utilizing a service on a separate subnet within the Azure environment to get into those virtual machines. It we don't have to then expose any uh, any public uh, public ports such as 4443 uh, for Bastion. It is essentially uh, doing a just in time type uh, type of uh, of access, but without actually opening that port up to the public, you know, and and having that going through an operating system. A bastion host does not actually have an operating system. It's would be just like using a load balancer on the front end of your of your web tier to uh, or traffic manager to get into the virtual machines for your website without having a public IP on those on those virtual machines and that essentially takes that public that public IP and removes it from that virtual machine and here's a little bit how uh, how it works kind of as that managed jump box. 
So it is a jump box. You know, it works very similarly to a jump box, but like I said, it is not an operating system that anybody can attack. Uh, it is on its own uh, subnet, uh, and if you are configuring it, you need to know that the subnet has to be named Azure Bastion subnet. That is a requirement as far as your configuration of the uh, Bastion service. Uh, and when you connect, you're connecting, like I said, right through the browser within the Azure portal to get to your virtual machines. There is no public IP address that needs to be exposed for the, uh, for the Azure VMs. You can remove that public IP right off of there, and the Azure Bastion subnet is then connecting through the private IP address because you have authenticated through the portal uh, and gone in to connect uh, through that subnet into your uh, into your target virtual machines, whether it's a Linux box or a Windows box, to do your management, and it acts just like your and provides. Uh, as far as an experience, the same experience that you see when you do as you would do uh, in terms of an RDP session on a Windows box. It gives you that exact, you know, that that remote desktop look where you're in that virtual machine, but it is not exposed to any port scans. You don't have it open uh, to the public. So if somebody is doing a random scan of port 3389, it's not going to see anything open because you are not open in any public IP address. And this I mentioned just in time VM access. So if you're not familiar and haven't uh, caught any of our previous talks where we've discussed just in time virtual machine access, this is where where you are being given a uh, given access to that virtual machine when you need it for a base amount of time, or where you re are requesting access and it's essentially opening up that uh, port at, in the network security group for your specific IP address at that, you know, at that particular time for a time range. And that can be used for RDP access as well. It's used for Bastion. So if you are initiate a Bastion connection and then you go to the network security group for that particular network interface, you can see that there has been a uh, an allow rule that has been created for your IP for uh, you know, to that virtual machine or to that that subnet of that virtual machine for and it'll be there for a limited basis until you dis until you disconnect or your time runs out, your time range runs out, and then that will revert back and automatically remove that rule so that nothing is left open and uh, and a, secu a potential security vulnerability be left on your network. So Bastion actually actually gives you a little bit more freedom there uh, because it does provide a little bit a little bit different access uh, with uh, with Azure Bastion and provide and complements it from that standpoint where it's giving both uh, just in time access as well as the Bastion direct connection is there as well. So you're and it's giving you an audit uh, auditability there as well in terms of who's accessing and uh, and during what times uh, so that if there is something that takes place, maybe uh, an internal threat, uh, we can go back and we can track what, that connect, what took place in terms of that connection. Now, how would you ultimately utilize, uh, utilize that as a on-premises management capability? And so here we look at you know, your privileged access workstation uh, where we now have, you know, the capability for uh, Azure Bastion to uh, access that virtual, uh, you utilize the Azure Bastion service to access the that privileged access workstation and perform those ad, admin tasks uh, on a authenticated uh, authenticated server uh, within our service. So we can use conditional access to verify uh, MFA and compliant devices are being used and then only give connection to those services based on uh, based on that compliance uh, and then and then we can get into those services as well so you can it works very well with uh, with those security services and those policies that you can put in place for uh, for access and I and 
uh, and that zero trust uh, model of uh, of accessing devices and accessing through only compliant devices. So we make sure that the risk of of a breach or uh, or a compromised device does not uh, does not create a risk to our virtual machines. And just some last points to just summarize what Azure Bastion is. You know, we talked about how it works, but from a standpoint of what Azure Bastion is, is it is a, a fully managed platform service rather than it being an infrastructure service of building a, of a virtual machine. And it provides that seamless secure access of, uh, of Windows R RDP or Linux SSH access to our devices, our virtual machines, through the portal, so and uh, and we'll show that here in a moment how we can how we how we do that and how that takes place. Uh, it avoids again that public uh, IP address exposure only using private IP addresses, so therefore we're not exposed. Uh, we can utilize conditional access and multi-factor authentication, verifying compliant devices to uh, for you know and for privileged access workstation type connections. Uh, and making sure that everything that's connecting through uh, and utilizing management on Azure Bastion is a the joint is a Azure Active Directory join device, and we can uh, can utilize those conditional access capabilities to restrict access to only privileged access workstation type devices that are compliant. Uh, one one caveat here is it does not currently support smart card use. Uh, if we're utilizing that for our our authentication uh, techniques uh, for uh, for uh, zero trust you know verification, uh, we would need to use things such as MFA for that connection basis. I don't know, Shannon. Do we want to go in and show Azure Bastion here quick? Bef nope, you're on mute. That's what I get for putting myself on mute. Yeah, we definitely can. I think that. Yeah, would, let's let's quickly show sense. how that connection works and how it how it uh, shoots that over into uh, into a network uh, security group rule. Okay, let me make sure I pick the right screen. Okay, so I've got two VMs in a VNet that has an Azure Bastion. All right, I've got this jump box that I use to access my Azure VMware solution environment. So you see how you click on, oh, well, actually, let's, let's talk about this real quick here. There's no public IP just a private IP. I don't have a site to site VPN connection or any sort of express route, right? Um, I'm not that, Microsoft pays me well, but they don't pay me that well. I have an ex my own dedicated express route circuit. <laughs> um, <laughs> so then, and like Dwayne had hit on, you can enable just in time. I tried to enable this earlier and I got some errors that I have to go and figure out. We have a lot of policies that are pushed on our internal subscription. So I suspect it's something that might be conflicting with one of the policies that already existed. So just know that I wasn't able to do it in time for it, but whatever VM you want to enable it, it's as simple as clicking on this and clicking on enable just in time, which is so easy to me. I feel like we've made Azure a lot more easier than it's been in previous times here. So we'll click on user, use Azure Bastion. And in theory, this loads. We've had, I've had some issues this week. Trying to load things. There we go. If I grab the password down here. Got a pretty secure password that I don't normally use, so I can never remember it. Yeah, and the one thing you can see is the admin, admin password and admin username is the same you would use if you were just if you're using a remote desktop connection. Correct. Uh, but it's just doing it in the portal. Correct, and if you're using a domain username, something that's tied to your Active Directory domain, it would just be your, your username at whatever domain you're a part of. So my own home domain is shakeen.net. Uh, that was a nickname from high school, so I just kept it as one of my domains over the years. And if you ever see me log in and you might see it, you might see that I've got like a username that's Inception. That's one of my uh, higher level administrator passwords that I, I use for some of the stuff I do within my demos where I'm trying to showcase what it's like when you set up hybrid environments to talk to Azure. Um, this is AVS, right? I won't log into here because I don't think that's super relevant, but without 
having some sort of jump box in the VNet that you deploy as your VMware solution, you won't be able to access the actual environment itself because it's kind of like VMware as a service. It's a little PaaS esque, even though it's really it's kind of in between IaaS and PaaS, I would think. But yeah, so then that way I'm accessing my vSphere environment through the Azure Bastion into the jump host, right? I also have, I'll go back here. I also have a Ubuntu VM, same thing. You can, you can also use just in time here as well. And now I don't have, I didn't do any of this. I probably should have because I feel like the SSH private key, having it come from Azure Key Vault, super cool stuff. Didn't have enough time, but just know there's a lot of flexibility here dependent upon your security posture because you know Azure Bastion in and of itself is very secure, but you can think about strengthening that even further with just in time or an SSH private key coming from Azure Key Vault. Give it a little bit here and now I'm in. So let's do uh, I'm installing Samba on the server here. If we flip back to the portal, we go back to the VM again, no public IP. There's no site to site connectivity established. There's no express route circuit, right? But the big piece here is I'm accessing it all over the uh, through port 443 via the portal. So it's a very secure way to think about hybrid connectivity. In fact, a lot of the customers I worked with once Bastion came out, they put it in every major VNet that they had because in the event there was ever an issue with a site-to-site -site VPN, right? Something happened, uh, something failed on-prem, maybe the express route circuit was having some problems. This was another way for them to actually access their VMs in a secure way where they're not already paying over an open port uh, inside of an Azure VM, right? So that was a, a cool win on the part of a lot of customers that were living in a hybrid state. So I think what I'll do here is I'll stop sharing Dwayne and we can go back to the uh, the presentation. presentation. Yeah. All right. And now, if you want to talk about Azure Arc, Shannon. Sure. Yeah. So I think taking a hybrid approach makes the most sense for our customers today. Um, not everybody has been super fast with getting environments 100% in Azure. And so as a result, uh, you have to think about tooling that enables you to have almost a like for like, right? I think a lot of folks are comfortable now with the operational tooling inside of Azure for ISVMs. Well, embracing the same sort of thing inside your on-prem world means you would lean on Azure Arc. So Azure Arc gives you that single pane of glass across your entire infrastructure. That's Lino uh, <laughs> Lindos, Linux and Windows servers. It's still a little early. I don't think the coffee's kicked in yet, uh, but you can, you can think about your Linux and your Windows VMs being a part of this, any Kubernetes clusters that you're hosting on-prem, any database services. This could be across different clouds. This could be on-prem and also the edge, right? So Azure Arc gives you a lot more flexibility where you bring your Azure services to any infrastructure, no matter where it exists or where it lives. You can and modernize your data centers with Azure Stack as well. So that's another cool feature of Azure Arc. In fact, a lot of the folks that are heavy on the Azure Stack, they love talking about Azure Arc because it helps them kind of enable that Azure Anywhere sort of feel. And then you can extend it also to the, the uh, Edge or Azure IoT Edge. So it's, it's kind of cool here if you think about all the different pieces that Azure Arc can hit on. So at a high level, it'll simplify governance and management by delivering a consistent multi-cloud and on-prem management platform. So you can run the Azure data services anywhere. You can extend the Azure management across your environments. You can adopt cloud practices on-prem and you can implement Azure security anywhere. So there's really great features. I think, you know, we've talked about the idea of being able to audit what's been deployed. That's really awesome here. Once you Azure Arc enable your servers, you're able to make use of those server objects inside of Azure Security Center and drill in to figure out ways that you can make those servers on-prem be more secure. So Azure Arc is really a set of technologies that extends Azure management capabilities in Azure services to be able to run that on-prem inside of multi-cloud environments and then at the edge as well. 
So you get that single control pane, which is really cool. So you can organize and govern resources at scale. That's related to tagging. That's related to policies. That really helps when you think about the different environments that have been spun up, especially if you're not very familiar with what different business units had spun up, right? A lot of times business units uh, run applications with middleware teams. You may not necessarily know 100% what you did outside of providing servers, right? So this will help you figure out ways to organize everything a little bit better. Um, you can adopt developer cloud practices on prem. That definitely helps, especially when you're modernizing and doing what you're doing, uh, you know, on prem and have it kind of match up to the same best practices and patterns that you're adopting inside of Azure. And then you can innate, you can implement the Azure security components anywhere, which is really neat as well. So there's some cool features that you wind up gaining once you implement this. So to unpack it a little bit more, Azure Arc enabled infrastructure uh, enables you to connect your resources uh, which live outside of Azure and operate them as if they were part of Azure. And I think that was a big win here with customers as they think through the digital, their digital transformation journey. Everybody's at a different phase. Not everybody is 100% cloud native. Uh, I feel like it's an ever evolving process and this is a fantastic way to gain visibility and have those same best practices that you're using for your Azure resources follow with your on-prem resources. So you've got the flexibility to deploy fully managed Azure services anywhere um, and it gives you the always up-to-date innovation. It'll, it'll match up based upon what you're doing inside of Azure already. So that's kind of a cool win if you're thinking about um, how to kind of modernize or structure all of the operational best practices that you are adhering to in Azure. You can now bring that to on-prem or at least have it match up to on-prem. And to hit home again, right? This is a slide we talked about earlier, but you can see that with the ever evolving complex environments, having Azure Arc as kind of the umbrella over the top really helps you gain that single pane of glass as you're deploying your hundreds and thousands of apps across a number of different environments. You've got a number of different languages that you're building uh, applications off of, the diverse infrastructure, and you've got multi-cloud as well. Uh, I've heard of customers who really like Azure Arc because they didn't really have great visibility when they were thinking about structuring what it made you know, what made sense in terms of multi-cloud universe, right? They had VMs in AWS. They didn't really have a lot of great visibility. They had VMs on-prem, and they were starting to build out VMs in Azure. So Azure Arc really helped unify all of those into a single pane of glass. So the, the use cases here are, you know, organizing and governing across environments. So you can tag, you can apply policy. That's a cool reality. You didn't have that feature a handful of years back. It became a headache trying to manage and maintain. A lot of times it turned into manual processes with an Excel spreadsheet. I think we want to get away from that, right? So this enables you to take all of those really cool features of Azure and plug them into wherever your environments exist. And then you can think about the at scale Kubernetes app management. So there are customers, and I didn't realize this until I came to Microsoft, really. I thought everybody just picked a managed flavor of Kubernetes. Now there are a bunch of customers that really were super savvy with Kubernetes. And so this gives you flexibility on seeing how your Kubernetes environments uh, kind of functioning as it relates to maybe what you've deployed inside of Azure as well. So that's kind of a cool reality. And then you've got the idea of being able to run data services anywhere. So you can gain a more feature rich understanding of how your data environments are performing. And it just needs, there's a handful of ways to onboard it, but then you can think about having the same best practices that get applied to Azure resources, applied to your on-prem or your different cloud-based data services as well. So with Azure Arc, you know, we're helping you address all these challenges, right? So you're getting visibility, you're understanding about all the different environments a lot better versus having to go to four or five different spots, to try and get a finger on the, on the pulse, so to speak. You wanna always understand how your environment's performing. It's been hard and we've heard customers with that feedback over the years. So this helps you from a visibility perspective, the compliance components, you are able to reduce risk and cost by establishing a single, single governance framework for your workloads, which is awesome. So you don't have to think about, uh, you know, any sort of overhead or additional approval processes or additional software procurement. You would just lean on the Azure components uh, as it stands inside of Azure Arc. Um, you can think about consistency. So everything will have the same framework, right? So whether it's an Azure VM, an on-prem VM, a VM in a different cloud, 
they'll all be consistent in the way that you have been managing your environment from an operational perspective. Um, you also have flexibility. So you've got the idea here of being able to, to reduce risk um, and adhere to kind of regulatory requirements. I think, you know, with a lot of these environments, number of customers don't really know what's been deployed. So that'll help you maintain that right visibility and flexibility so you can start to think about reconfiguring environments so they match compliance regulatory, uh, sorry, regulatory compliance requirements. Uh, and then if you think about latency too, so you'll be able to deploy your, your data services on-prem, so they're close to everything, but you can still manage them and maintain them as if they were living in Azure. And then, you know, everything's always current too. So you'll get, you know, Evergreen SQL, uh, SQL and Postgres SQL hyperscale on-prem with a cloud billing model. You don't have to think about the idea of understanding what you're building on-prem as it relates to what you're building inside of Azure. You can think about having the, the current tooling help you on, on that front. So Azure Arc really provides the Azure services and management capabilities on any infrastructure anywhere. So you get, you know, there's Azure Arc for servers, there's Azure Arc for Kubernetes, and there's Azure data services on Azure Arc. So you can think about, you know, the organization and governance. You can manage those Kubernetes applications at scale, and then you can run your data anywhere. So it's kind of a cool reality. And there's more features that are supposedly coming at some point. So I am fascinated. I am not as glued into the engineering teams as some of the other folks uh, on my team are, but this has been an interesting reality to kind of go into this and understand it more and more. And I feel like, you know, customers are embracing this uh, without a lot of hesitation because it gives them a lot more flexibility to see what's been deployed and to have that single pane of glass. With the Azure Arc enabled servers, you know, you can reach your Linda, Linux and Windows servers, not your Windows. I don't know why I keep saying that. <laughs> your, Linda, your, your Linux and Windows servers and your bare metal servers, these can be domain agnostic, right? They don't have to be members of a domain. These can be physical servers as well. Um, you can organize and inventory what you've got. Um, I think sometimes it's hard to know what you have because you've got probably a handful of different solutions that are handling any sort of CMB, CMDB tooling for you. Then you've got the governance and security, so the built-in Azure policies, baselines that you can start to match it up against. We've talked about that, right? So once you Azure Arc enable a server, you can run it through baseline compliance and understand, do my servers actually meet security baseline requirements for us to maintain our regulatory compliance, right? So I think that really helps. And then you get the centralized agent management. I'll talk a little bit about that. Plus you get the idea, or I'll walk through that, I should say. You'll, you'll get the idea of thinking that through through. Um, you know, you've got monitoring, security, and update management that you can take part of. You don't have to have SCOM any, or sorry, SCCM anymore. You don't have to think about, you know, a rigorous uh, maybe YUM server for your, your Linux VMs. And then your role-based operations, so you can start to think through centralizing uh, in managing your at-scale operations. Workload owners uh, can manage, you know, based upon their access. It's a cooler reality when you think about Azure Arc enabling your servers. And then from an Azure management perspective, you wind up getting that single control pane for your Azure native and Arc, Azure Arc resources. So you get all of the same tooling and experiences. So Portal Shell, Bash, the Azure CLI, ecosystem marketplace. Um, you know, you can think about your management services. I think everybody's fairly familiar with all of the different services. Um, you know, you can think about everything that hits the Azure Resource Manager control plane. You've got all of that flexibility, but I think the big piece here is, um, you know, you don't have to think about your environments on prem being managed by something completely separate, right? It can be the same area that you manage your environment inside of Azure. You don't have to go kind of back and forth between two different environments to manage and maintain it. And the one thing I want to pull out here too is you can also then on your local tools, right? So you don't have to 100% embrace Azure. By Azure Arc enabling your servers, you can think about also leaning on local tooling as well. I think the big piece here with this slide is I want to highlight, you have a ridiculous amount of flexibility. You have options. You don't have to use Azure Arc, but if you Azure, if you Azure Arc enable your servers, you gain a lot of cool features that help you out, especially if you're moving your environment more and more into Azure. 
But then you can also think about leaning on local tooling that have helped you maintain operational best practices over time. You, know, you don't have to 100% embrace Azure Arc and lean on Azure Arc and always go to Azure to maintain your environment. It still works very well with local tooling. So Azure Arc enabled servers allows you, as we've talked about, to manage those different servers that don't live inside of Azure, but managing them as if they were in Azure. So, you know, you get this experience with your hybrid machines hosted outside of Azure. You use the machine connected agent that needs to be installed on each machine that you plan on connecting with Azure. Um, this agent doesn't deliver any other functionality and it doesn't replace the log analytics agent, right? So, you know, there's always a recommendation of placing a log analytics agent on your VMs as well. That helps you from a centralized perspective of logging and understanding how monitoring, you, know, you can kind of monitor your environment that way. Um, you know, if you think about the idea of putting a log analytics agent on there, then it helps you a little bit more related to Azure Security Center as well. So, you know, if you look at this, um, you know, you've got the idea here of all of the management services that you're used to. So monitoring, update, backup, security center, and more. And then you've got, you know, the machine connected agent. That's really what links you into all of this. And that helps you be able to handle your environment as if those VMs were living inside of Azure. Uh, as it stands. So it's kind of a, a cool reality in the sense that you don't have to do too much outside of installing the connected agent and then installing the log analytics agent because I feel like those work very much so side by side. And that's what enables you to reach that achievement unlocked section surrounding you know, the idea that you're able to, to bring about Azure to your on-prem VMs. And then this is kind of the high level overview Right, so you've got the instance metadata service that's identity in the MSI. So the so the resource ID, the token to access things like Azure uh, Key Vault. So those are what live on the actual Azure host. Now, when this gets to, now that's kind of what you would see related to how everything gets managed and maintained inside of Azure using all of the tooling that we've talked about over the course of this series. If you think about the on-prem side, there's the Azure Connected Machine Agent, and it's the IMDS. That's, that's the consistent interface that allows you to talk to Azure so that this object is then presented inside of Azure Resource Manager, and that enables you to bring about extensions. Because if you think about it, extensions are something that only came about once we built out the IaaS platform but you've got capacity to think about extensions that can be deployed to your on-prem VMs and help you manage and maintain what's happening on-prem. Now, the extension isn't really installed in your on-prem world, but it will help you think through all of the ways in which you can take on the Azure services, right? So everything from Azure Backup, uh, Update Management, Azure Security Center, et cetera, right? So that's where you think about building all of this in and really the connected uh, Azure Connected Machine Agent, think of that as the glue that enables all of this to happen. So let's let's flip over here to the portal. Let me close out of my Bastion demo. Let's go down here to the screen. I will go back to my home. OK, so let's go into Azure Arc. Like every Azure service, there's an overview. Right? the infrastructure section, the data services section, the learn more. These are all really awesome. In fact, I, I like these documents quite a bit on our um, online docs. I think these are, are pretty great resources. So you'll see all of the Azure Arc services I have registered, right? These are servers that live in my on-prem environment, my home lab, so to speak. This I won't talk about too much because it, it's dealing with Kubernetes and I don't have any Kubernetes clusters that I'm running right now. Um, but let's talk a little bit here about the servers. So you see right here, there's a handful that don't have tags, right? So if we wanted to tag this, we could go down to the tags, add the data center tag. And my environment at home is shakeen.net, so I just keep shakeen and a lot of my uh, references to my on-prem infrastructure. Hit apply. Let me get back out of here. 
I don't, it takes a little bit of time here. I'll try and give it a couple more seconds here, but pretty soon that tag will show up. That might help you from a billing perspective. That might help you from the ability to schedule any sort of patches. If you take on Azure Update Management, you could think about every tag that has Shakin goes through a patch cycle, right? Or any patch that has production uh, that you want to push to your production machines, you could have it apply on a tag basis inside of Azure Update Management, which is kind of cool. Let's see if that was enough time. Nope. Maybe I can come back to it. Oh, there it is. So now it shows up there and that that shows you now that tag doesn't exist on prem. It just exists in the metadata surrounding the server object after I've Azure Arc enabled it on my um, VM on prem. So if you think about kind of onboarding. So let's go through the onboarding process. So this is the idea here, you know, make sure you identify and connect a server. You want to make sure that this server, you know, has access to port 443. Um, these are the outbound URLs. I don't worry about this as much for me because I'm mostly doing a lot of demos, but if you have a more restrictive environment, this is a great link to go and take a look at. Um, you know, you want to make sure you've got local administrator per permission on the VM that you're trying to onboard. So we'll tie this to a different subscription. We'll tie this to this resource group. The operating system is Windows. I don't have a proxy URL, but if you did, like if you had a more restrictive IP based communication pattern into cloud, this is where you'd be placing that server proxies URL. And then we can download and run the script, right? This is just for one VM. So if, if you're on that VM, this is the script that you would run. It's as straightforward as downloading it. Let's open the file. And this is what the file is doing. Oops, I had it open. It downloads the package. It runs a handful of commands and it installs it, but this requires you to log into your server, right? So whatever server you're onboarding, this is a great way to onboarding it. But but what if you want to kind of onboard at scale, right? Let's see, I think it's down. Yeah, down here. So this is where you'd add multiple servers. So you'll generate the script, same sort of process related to onboarding. I will set this in the right subscription, the right resource group. It, these are all Windows servers. And this is your authentication. So we've talked a little bit about service principles, but they allow you to do specific actions. And this service principle has the Azure connected machine onboarding role assigned. So I can lean on this service principle. Now I can add tags if I want to. That's how I started adding tags before, right? I won't necessarily go into it just now. In fact, I think what I'm going to do, well, I will just download and run the script. So this script's a little bit different, right? You're looking for the service principal client ID. This is where you would tie the secret in. I won't show you the script that I use because I does have the secret tied in there, but it's as simple as downloading the script. And then you can see I've downloaded it a couple times too. And then this one's ever so slightly different, right? So you're adding the service principal client ID, the service principal secret, and then you're able to download the package and you don't have to do anything, right? Like literally you can copy and paste this, uh, plug it into a PowerShell prompt and run it and it will just run, right? But you wanna make sure that you put the secret in. So what does it look like when the actual environment is 100% inside of Azure? Well, they look like VM objects, right? So let's go into this. So I'm in the process of upgrading my Azure Active Directory Connect server. I haven't yet done it uh, and will do it soon, but I feel like this is a good one to, to start with. So this looks very similar to every other VM in Azure, right? And this VM is literally over here in my uh, little home, home domain environment, or little home lab, right? So you've got the activity log, just like you would if it was a VM and there's nothing there. Um, I think if I were to change this around a little bit, you might see different features, but I think like yesterday when I was onboarding it, I saw that the service principal had done some related to onboarding the server. Just like every server, you've got your IM, your tags, right? Um, and then you could diagnose and solve problems. Um, let's go back up here to the overview. So you see this login analytics agent should be installed on your Windows based Arc machine. 
So let's, and, and this should look familiar, right? This is definitely Azure Security Center. So if you wanted to go in and take a look at this, it's going to look just like Azure Security Center did, right? So Security Center uses the Log Analytics agent to collect events from your Azure Arc enabled machines. So to de deploy the agent on all Azure Arc machines, follow the remediation steps. And this is the, the quick fix, and this is the manual fix, right? But I think the cool feature of this is I can literally click on that, click on fix, tie it to a workspace. I want to tie it to that one and hit fix one resource. Now, this will take some time. And what I will do is I will, um, how are we doing on time? We've got about five minutes here. So I'll let this run and then I'll um, RDP into the machine here. And you should see an updated MMA agent and you'll see also the Windows connected agent. Um, so, but let's go back here to home and that's fine because it's deploying. Let's go into security center. Let's go into secure score. Let's take a look at this. So, log analytics agent should be installed on your Windows VM. So you see I've got 21 Azure Arc enabled VMs. A couple of them have the log analytics agent. When I click on this, I'll see all of them, right? And these are VMs. And see now I just had kicked that one off, right? So now it's going to show up as gray because it's in the process of being installed, right? And there's some communication patterns happening between on-prem and Azure. But now I can easily enable lo the log analytics agent on all of these. And so I think maybe what makes sense here, well, actually I won't go through that because I feel like I, I, I will do that, but I mean, it's I just onboarded a bunch of these. And so I feel like there's a lot of cool things I could still do without you know, doing everything all at once. Um, let me see, so I will bring up this server here. If I can refresh it. No, nope. well, you see the connected agent there. So I think since it's still going through the process of onboarding it, might take a little bit more time before it shows up. But I think the, the cool thing here is, you know, you've got your servers now showing up in Azure Security Center. And depending upon what sort of policies you've applied to your VMs, you'll start to see those VMs get factored into your secure score. And that runs every 24 hours. So even if you remediate, things won't be updated until 24 hours from the point in which you remediate. So that's kind of cool. Um, but yeah, that's where I, I saw this quite a, quite a bit yesterday when I was getting everything prepped for today. Um, I noticed that this is a great way. And then what you're able to do from there, let's go back to this VM specifically. So you've got the idea of drilling into Azure Security Center, which we just did, right? You can take a look at the extensions that are deployed. So that's been deployed. Now, granted, that extension doesn't really exist on-prem. Um, it exists as metadata for the most part inside of Azure. Um, you can think about the policies that you want to apply, right? And it's non-compliant because of that log analytics component that's not on the VM just yet. Yeah, so that's showing up. There's no centralized security log management and analysis. There's no, now I've got Azure Defender enabled and it's been pushed by policy to this subscription. So once the log analytics agent is on the VM on-prem, this will change the score and these will both be registered as compliant. Um, and I did enable this or so I thought I've got to go figure this out, but if update management was enabled, um, you'd be able to go in here and take a look at how this server relates to the patches that you have scheduled. This would be your inventory and your change tracking. I'm not sure why it doesn't show up. That's kind of unfortunate. I'll have to go figure all that out. <laughs> But yeah, so you, you see how easy it is just to get into these great feature rich tools that help you related to kind of the operational toolkit, right? Like you could start to think about maybe it doesn't make sense to have SCCM handle all your Windows based patching. Maybe you lean on Azure Update Management. Um, you know, you still can have SCCM, you still can use this, but um, you don't maybe maybe start to think about lessening the infrastructure you've got on prem to handle patching. Same with Linux servers as well. So the monitoring, I don't, I wouldn't have application insights installed on any of these VMs. I'm not a developer by trade. I just play one on TV. I've done more developer-esque things since I've been in the cloud, but I'm not a software developer, so I, nothing would really show up here. 
But this is cool. You're able to go into the log analytics workspace and you see that it's the actual the, the VM itself as it lives on prem. And I could run things like. Let's see if I just get some records from this. I should. Oh, I think I need some more. Let's see. I'm going off of memory. Uh, I think, yeah. So the reality would be, let's see, maybe I can pick up some heartbeat queries here. Let's do computer IP. I think I'm going to have to, yeah, I don't, I don't have anything pre-canned, but hopefully it shows that you would be able to lean on log analytics and I don't have anything pulled up. And I guess also too, the agent only just installed. So it takes a little bit of time to have some of this trickle in, but once the agent's installed, you'd be able to go in and take a look at some of these queries. You could look at some of the pre-populated ones that live here, right? Um, that agent on-prem helps you be able to read some of the logs inside of log analytics. So let me just go back to the server itself. We should see the monitoring agent now is installed with an install date of today. So now it's got the updated MMA agent, the Microsoft monitoring agent. It's got the Azure connected machine agent, and that's what helps this VM show up as a VM object inside of Azure. So I think that's that's a good overview. And then remember, this will show up as kind of a, an advisor until about 24 hours from now. So that'll still show up, but eventually this will go away and it will be compliant based upon the policies that have been pushed to my subscriptions. It'll help my secure score inside of Azure Security Center and then I've got more visibility as to how my environment on prem is performing. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing. Yep. Very good, Shannon. So yeah, so we've talked about, you know, the hybrid strategy that it's going to be a big part of most companies strategies going forward. I don't think everything will be 100% in Azure for our bit yet. So having that hybrid strategy is important. We talked about, you know, connecting to VMs, the ways in which you do it, how some of them are insecure versus secure and how Azure Bastion can be installed or provisioned to help. And then talking about Azure Arcs, you've got that single pane of glass that helps you understand your security baselines so your on-prem VMs can match up to what you're hopeful for when you have those regulatory audits from your compliance auditors. And that wraps up today. Thanks, Shannon, and thank everybody for uh, watching this Skill Me Up expert talk on uh, Azure Bastion and Azure Arc and how we can securely manage and connect our resources both uh, in a Azure cloud environment as well as a hybrid environment. Uh, feel free to take a look on our uh, website or our YouTube channel for any previous talks that Shannon and I have done as well as some of our other uh, training our cloud architects and uh, and special guests and Shannon and I will be back with a, another episode in this series, uh, the security series in a couple weeks. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone.